So let us make the start of today's presentation. AP entrance had been a great uh, enigma for a lot of people because some used to shoot in the first top 20 ranks in the Ames entrance, but they used to have a merciless uh, uh, failure in uh, the AP. So everything can happen, doctor, just like the local elections can be different from that of central elections. Uh, but anyway, it is all few fixed topics which you need to basically master and the last 45 to 60 days of your preparation is going to focus totally on what is going to be asked in the entrance, nothing less than that, okay? So left gonadal vein drains into, left renal vein, right gonadal vein drains, basically right renal vein drains into the inferior vena cava is what need to be basically remembered. So this you can classically see the presence of the kidney with the renal vein and you can also appreciate that the gonadal vein is passing uh, towards the renal vein and it will be draining into the renal vein. This MR picture gives you a complete appearance. Then what is this varicocele doctor basically? It is due to the absence of the valves, one of the longest veins of the body that is in the left gonadal vein which is draining into the left renal vein. Commonly if there is a coexistent renal cell carcinoma it can present itself with a varicocele is what need to be basically remembered. Even in the case of the female, female genital tract malignancies also, gonadal vein is very important. This shows you a pedunculated subserosal uterine myoma and what these arrows are pointing is towards the gonadal vein. Of course here the right gonadal vein which has become very prominent but uh, the left gonadal vein will be draining into the renal vein is what need to be remembered. Let us go to the next question. What is not a component of uh, the basal ganglia? Because one question has come in PGA, AIMS and also AP host. So you can't escape the topic of basal ganglia doctor, a strong topic. So please remember we have two wonderful thalami. Thalamus is called the bedroom of the brain where all the sensory inputs will be reaching the uh, thalamus is what need to be remembered. On the side of the thalamus you have what you call as the globus pallidus which is number one in the basal ganglia and you are having one caudate nucleus, caudate has got one head and it also has got one tail. In addition to that you also have one putamen, so all these things basically constitute the basal ganglia but not the thalamus. So basically thalamus coordinates with the basal ganglia. Thalamus receives the signals from the cerebellum, it also receives the signals from the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia continuously will be uh, causing a inhibition on the uh, uh, thalamus whereas cerebellum will be causing a uh, stimulation towards the thalamus is what need to be remembered. Can you tell me what type of cerebral palsy will be involving the basal ganglia doctor? Ethetoid type of cerebral palsy typically involves uh, the cerebellum and the basal ganglia is what need to be remembered. So in the cut section of the brain you can classically appreciate that um, typically this is the ventricle doctor. What you are having is here the thalamus and here you are having the caudate nucleus. Between these two you will be having uh, the internal capsule which will be passing over here and uh, here you are having the globus pallidus and uh, all these things basically are associated with the fine control is what I want to underscore to all of you. Connections of the basal ganglia are also very important doctor. Prefrontal cortex is basically connected with uh, which of the basal ganglia? It is connected with the caudate uh, nucleus, the prefrontal cortex is associated. So also the premotor cortex is connected with the caudate and to the putamen and uh, uh, this is the whole picture. What do you mean by neostriatum doctor? Caudate plus putamen put together is called neostriatum and the striatum means caudate plus putamen plus globus pallidus. Globus pallidus has got two components. Globus pallidus interna, globus pallidus externa. So this whole thing uh, put together is called the striatum is what need to be basically remembered. Can you tell me one uh, classical disease where the basal ganglia is at fault doctor? Huntington's disease is a typical situation where chorea will be the typical presentation in the case of the Huntington's chorea. Can you tell me one other condition where uh, uh, chorea is a clinical presentation? Rheumatic fever where sudden hands chorea will be there. Can you tell me which is the most common clinical feature among the Jones criteria in the uh, rheumatic fever? Conitis is the most common. Most rare feature is sudden hands chorea. Most specific feature is sit in hands chorea once more. So generally most rare will be most specifics. Classics are the books which are never read. Like Shakespeare, we say classic but how many have read? So also is the sit in hands chorea. So Huntington's disease typically will be involving um, the um, 
atrophy of the basal ganglia. Hence, you compare the normal ventricles in a normal individual versus that of a patient who has got Huntington's disease where basal ganglia got atrophied and the ventricles got dilated is what I want to underscore to all of you. Let's go to the next question. Lumbar plexus. What are all the branches of the lumbar plexus? What are the branches of the lumbosacral plexus? You need to be very clear. That's what the examiner is questioning you. Please remember, out of these nerves, the sciatic nerve is basically formed by the pelvic fibers um, from the lumbosacral trunk, that is the L4 and L5, and also from the S1, S2, S3. It is not a nerve which is originating only purely from the lumbar plexus. Whereas, the obturator nerve, the femoral nerve, and the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, all of these will be deriving from the lumbar plexus is what need to be basically remembered. Now let us look at uh, how the lumbosacral plexus typically looking like. It has got the fourth fifth, and fifth lumbar um, um, uh, what you call roots. In addition to that, the first sacral, second sacral, third and fourth and fifth sacral will be constituting what you call as the lumbosacral plexus. If you take the sciatic nerve, it has got two major components. It has got one uh, common peroneal nerve and it has got one tibial nerve. Finally, it is going to divide into these two. But if you look at uh, the root value of this uh, sciatic nerve, it is taking the origin from both the lumbar plexus and also from the sacral plexus, not purely from the lumbar plexus is what you have to basically understand. Sciatic is the thickest nerve that you find which will be passing below the level of this pyriformis muscle. And in fact, while giving the uh, intramuscular injection, the safest zone is the upper outer quadrant is what you will be teaching to your nursing student who is working in your ward, okay? Or rather, she may teach you while you are working as house surgeon, vice versa, whichever is possible. So finally, this common peroneal nerve will be dividing into two components. Sciatic becomes the common peroneal and tibial. Common peroneal divides into two branches. One is superficial and other is deep. Superficial supplies the lateral com compartment and the deep will be supplying the anterior compartment is what need to be identified. Now let us look at what are all the branches of the lumbar plexus. Lumbar plexus will be originating from the first lumbar, second, third, fourth and fifth lumbar. Now what are the branches of this lumbar plexus doctor? Iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, genitofemoral, lateral femoral cutaneous and the nerve to the psoas and ileus, the femoral and the accessory obturator and the obturator all these are basically purely deriving from the lumbar plexus is what need to be clearly understood. Let's go to the next question. So what is going to be in the next AP entrance question? Paper will leak now only. Brachial plexus will be the question doctor this time. You will, you will think of me while writing the test. Okay. Herbs and Dukins you should master. Okay. Superior intercostal artery is a branch of the costo cervical trunk. Typically, the subclavian will be giving origin to the costo cervical trunk and costo cervical trunk typically will be giving the rise to the uh, first intercostal vessel which is the superior intercostal artery is what need to be basically remembered. Now, let us talk about the epididymis. Appendix of epididymis is basically remnant of what? Men don't have the Mullerian duct. Women don't have the Wolfian duct is what need to be remembered. So, if you take the testis, it has got one epididymis, it has got um, uh, one uh, appendix which is located over here. Now, we are talking about this appendix, what is it basically the remnant of? Please remember doctor, 92% of all the testis will be containing this appendix which is located along the superior testicular pole. It is located between the groove which is formed by the testis and the epididymis is what need to be basically understood. Before we talk about from where it is originating in a blind way, we must know where is it located first. So, typically this um, appendix of epididymis is one more thing that is there, which will be present in 23% of cases. It is projecting from the head of the epididymis. So, typically if you take the appendix of the epididymis, it is basically atritic in men. So, what becomes atritic in men? Mullerian or Wolfian? Mullerian. So, misonephric... Uh, uh, duct is basically the one uh, which will be the uh, giving the rise to the appendix of the epididymis. Yeah, there, uh, there is a small uh, uh, change in the options. Eh? 
I mean, these options are all based on the recall of the students at the end of the test. That's the reason um, it was like that. In fact, there are two, three questions which have got uh, options very similar and uh, kind of mistakes we do in the Sunday test. They are also doing it. Uh, so you need to bear with the examiner. Good. But a good recovery, recall doctor of your last uh, nostalgic memories of the last year entrance. You can add some more. Uh, so because that is important. Uh, let's go to the next question. Heart rate increases with what? Baroreceptors, if you stimulate in a patient who has got a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia, the heart rate will be normalizing. So decreased stimulation of the baroreceptors must increase the heart rate. Increased stimulation need to decrease the heart rate uh, is what need to be basically remembered. Now, can you tell me, doctor, in the baroreceptor reflex, what is the afferent and what is the efferent? Afferent is basically transmitted by the carotid sinus, glossopharyngeal and the vagus to the nucleus tractus solitarius. Can you tell me nucleus tractus solitarius is a sensory nucleus for three nerves. What are they? N for ninth, T for tenth, S for seventh for these three nerves. Nucleus tractus solitarius is the common sensory nucleus is what need to be remembered. Where is it located doctor? In the middle or in the pons? In the? Very simple to remember. 3rd and 4th are located in midbrain, 5th, 6th, 7th are located in pons, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th is located in the medulla. There should not be any confusion. Nucleus ambiguous is associated with the cranial nerve, 10 and 9. So, so th these uh, basic questions you should basically remember. And different of this carotid reflex is, uh, I mean baroreceptor reflex is carried by the vagus nerve and the sympathetic is what need to be remembered. Let's go to the next question. Actually, I could not get uh, what is the meaning of this question. It was uh, a little erroneous in framing. So that's the reason. Let us leave this question. Let's go to the next. Spirometer, can it calculate the total lung capacity? Why? Because residual volume cannot be calculated by the spirometer and total lung capacity contains the residual volume is what it remembered. Let us have a quick revision, doctor. One more question. This time also entrance, it is going to come. Paper is already out there that uh, spirometry is one topic, any entrance you write. Total lung capacity is normally how much doctor? 5 liters. And vital capacity is the maximum volume of the air that can be expelled at the normal rate of exhalation after a maximum inspiration. So this is the vital capacity. Here, what he has done is, uh, exhalation is done after a maximal inspiration. Ex uh, the, uh, um, uh, exhalation is not forced. Inspiration is uh, maximal is what need to be remembered. Now the tidal volume that is normally when we are uh, not excited, not depressed, uh, the tidal volume will be about 500 ml. Residual volume which we can never expel from our lungs uh, in the lifetime. So some of the mistakes in entrance exam also will be like residual volume. If you can correct even those mistakes also your rank will improve. So that is the whole purpose doctor of reading the book uh, that it is not how many pages, how many times we revised it how much of residual volume we could exhale out so that we are with less ignorance while going to the exam. The topper is the one who has the, the least ignorant in that cohort. So that need to be remembered.